All right, hello everyone. Welcome to C++ for Java programmers. This is lecture five. Um, couple reminders, got office hours, um, Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. Kane has office hours, uh, Monday through Thursday, eight to nine and 4.30. I'm gonna hang out until the last student has helped. If there's no one that arrives within about uh, 15 minutes of 1 p.m., uh, I'm gonna just call closed office hours. And if you arrive later, I'll send you an email. I've had a couple of students who just uh, put a ticket in the queue at weird times. That's a great clue to me that I need to reach out and talk to you guys. So go ahead and do that. Um, even if it's not office hours, we can uh, set up an appointment. All right. Um, so there's a, uh, the code that I'm going to develop today. It should be on Canvas by the time you guys are watching this. I would encourage you to just open up a blank document and follow along. But if you would prefer to um, look at the entirety of the code that I'm going to develop and just sort of follow along that way, you're welcome to. Programming is one of those things that you really do learn by doing, though. So I would encourage you guys to just follow along, make up your own experiments, and um, yeah, just uh, explore. All right, um, homework two. Uh, I've been really struggling to get this one finished. Uh, my doctors want me to reduce stress, get plenty of sleep. Uh, I'm way more stressed by not having this done than I am by not sleeping, so I'm just going to load up on caffeine. I am getting this done tonight. It will be out there by the time you guys wake up tomorrow morning. Or I'll probably be back in the hospital. One of the two. Um, and then when you have problems or anything, uh, go ahead, uh, grab a screenshot of the error message. You can either email that to us or you can uh, post it on Piazza. If there's code there, like more than five lines of code, uh, go ahead and make that a private post. All right. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump over to uh, CSL Machine and start developing the code that you guys will download over here. One sec while I pull that up. All right, so I've jumped over onto a CSL machine and I have my sort of standard template as I begin to re uh, record lectures, I'm including IO stream today so that I can print stuff out using namespace standards, that magic line that lets me uh, not have to write STD colon colon for all of the C out and end line statements. Um, got my main function, it's just got a test statement and I'm returning zero. This lets me just compile it and make sure that I haven't made any typos before I begin the lecture. All right, so I'm gonna get started. Today we're gonna to be talking about arrays. And these are gonna be the primitive arrays. Uh, where I just, so last time I went over the various types of primitives we have, uh, int, long, short, unsigned, those things, care. So as we get started to make an array of those data types, uh, I just need the name of the type. I'm gonna use int for my example to get started. I need the name of the variable. I'll call this one data. And I need square brackets to tell um, C++ that this is an array. I also need to know the size of the array um, when I declare this. Now there's a caveat here. Uh, C99, not C++, did include uh, variable length arrays or VLAs. If the compiler supports variable length arrays that you're using, then uh, you do not need to give it the size at compile time, it can take it at runtime. So I can get like user input and create an array of that size using this sort of notation. If I want to do it in C++ without that, there's some tricks and we'll go over that uh, in the future. But, um, and if anybody out there in the comments knows the answer, has this been included in the latest version of C++? I couldn't find it, I did some searching. Uh, let me know uh, if it's there and where you found it. Okay, just another example here. Um, if C++ can figure out the length of the array from initialization, like um, uh, this one example, so it can count the number of characters for us and figure out how many um, characters to reserve space for, it'll fill this in for us. So it's actually pretty smart. It doesn't need me to count the characters and actually put the number in right there. It can take care of that. And same with um, list initialization. So if I have another uh, array, we'll call this one limits, uh, I can give it the empty brackets, and then I can use list initialization, uh, 10, 12, 14, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, something like that, so that uh, C++ can count these, one, two, three, four, five, and knows that it needs to reserve space for five integers. All right, so I've just got four notes here about creating primitives arrays. First note that the brackets go after the name of the variable. 
um, not after the type like in Java. So uh, if you're a Java programmer, it's going to be easy for you to grab the, I put those in the wrong spot. All right, second, arrays are not objects. They don't have any associated method with them, methods with them. Um, it's just data. Uh, really, the only thing we can do is use the brackets to access things, index into them. Uh, third, they do not know how big they are. There's no method to get the size. It's, uh, C++ does not keep track of this number for us. So this is an array of 100. This is an array of 5. It's up to us to remember how many elements there are. And fourth, there's absolutely no bounds checking. It's totally valid to access things that are outside of the array. Uh, let me go ahead and do some examples of array access. And I'm just going to print some stuff out. So we'll see out. And in this case, I'm going to just use limits because that's actually been initialized. Limits of, we'll just grab the first one. Equals limits zero. And print that out. So this is the part right here where I'm accessing the array. To index into an array, I just need the square brackets and I need the, the index. Um, let me go ahead and compile this and run it. So to do that within Vim, I just uh, go back to command mode by pushing escape. I push the colon to get the, the command menu. The exclamation mark lets me run shell commands and wait, save it first. Then exclamation mark, G++. Uh, I named this lecture five. So we do that. It compiles, enter to continue. Then I can run this exclamation mark for a shell command again. It's uh, automatically named a dot out for me. When I run this, uh, here we go, limit 0 equals 10. That's the only thing I've got it printing right now. Uh, enter to go back. I'm going to print out a couple more things. So I'm going to grab this line uh, twice more. And let's just print out element. Hmm. Minus 1. And we'll go ahead and print out element 10. So I need a minus one here. Looks like I missed. There we go, and element 10. We'll write that, compile it, no errors, and run this. Okay, so we can see that it didn't stop me. There was no error. Uh, it let me print out element minus one and element 10. Like I said, absolutely no bounds checking. It all right, list initialization is also one of the very rare circumstances under which C++ will default initialize something for us. So for example, um, let me grab another, we'll do an array of doubles, call it cost. We'll give it five pieces of data, but then I'm gonna use list initialization to put in a bunch of data. So I have 2.31 and 5.35, um, 3.84, Got an extra character there. All right, and then I'm just going to go and print these out. So for int i equals 0, i less than 5, i plus plus, let's see out um, cost of i equals, cost to quote, cost of i. Um, Made a mistake there. Quick typo fix. There we go. And when we run this, we can see that hmm, we can see that I had one more typo. I didn't write 3.84. I wrote 3.84. My bad. I'll fix that in a second. Um, but it did initialize the last value to zero. All right. Let me go ahead and uh, get that fixed. All right, I just came back in, I put the, the dot there instead of a comma. I also used the variable i, so it's not printing out cost of i, it's gonna print the numbers. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. We'll run this, compiled just fine. And colon, exclamation mark, a dot out. There we go. So now 2.31, 5.35, 3.84, it's got my numbers in here, and it has initialized the rest of the array members to zero. But one more example real quick. I'm gonna pause the video and type this in. All right, so I've just added an example with some string. Uh, I've got names with, this is a primitive array of nine strings. Um, I'm giving it the first two, Iron Man and Thor. The rest will be initialized to the empty string. That's just regular quotes. Um, 
something like just like that. I'm going to leave this for now. Um, it's going to go through and print out all of the names, and we'll see that they are all in, oops, undo, all initialized to the empty string. I already compiled it, so we'll just run this, and we see we've got Iron Man Thor and a whole bunch of blank lines here. Um, let me just go ahead and make one real quick adjustment. I'm going to insert right here an indexing. I'm going to take names. Um, so the variable has nine entries in it. So that's going to be indices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There is no index 9. And I'm just going to go ahead and set this one to, uh, let me think, who's your favorite Avenger? I'll go with um, Captain America. All right. There we go. So now we can see that we've got all the blank lines. They've all been initialized to zero, and the last element in the array is now Captain America. All right, last topic on primitive arrays um, before we move on to pointers um, is that we cannot copy or assign them directly. So just here's what I mean by this. Uh, right up there, here I've got an int array limits. I'm just going to create a new array, int limits 2. I'm going to give it, um, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 elements, and I'm going to say that's equal to limits. Okay, so um, here's what I'm trying to do is create a new array, make it the same size, and uh, assign it this stuff right here. All right, so let me just show you what happens. I'm going to write that. I'm going to compile, and it's going to give me an error. So array must be initialized with brace initialize, a closed initializer. So I can't just give it the uh, uh, an existing array. I have to use those curly braces and actually assign the values that way. So this does not work. Um, there's also no copying. So this is me trying to create a new array and use the, the copy operator. All right, I'm going to just comment this out. That does not work. Can't do that. I also can't do this. Int limits 2, get to the right size. We'll create this. This is totally fine. But then I can't do the assignment. Limits equal, uh, limits 2 equals limits. This is also going to fail. So this would be the assignment version. We'll write that. We'll compile this. And we see that, um, so this error message is invalid array assignment. I can't do this. All right, and finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about relational operators with arrays. So I'm going to include IO manipulation, and then I'm just going to print out, let's see, I've got an array limits 2 here, and I've got an array limits. They should be different, but I should be able to, um, let's just pull alpha. That'll either print true or false when I do this relational operator. Does limits to exactly equal limits? There we go. Get rid of that. Write that. Compile it. That compiled good. And now it got out. So it's printing all that stuff, and we see false here. So relational operators do work with arrays. Now what they're doing is actually comparing the address in memory where those two arrays have reserved space. So it's a great way to see if they're actually the identical array or um, if not. Uh, the rest of the relational operators are really kind of meaningless. If one array is less than another, that just means it's stored at a lower memory address. And uh, depending on where the compiler puts things, uh, can be completely arbitrary. All right, guys, I just reviewed some of the uh, recording I did, and I got to tell you, I feel like when I try and type and talk at the same time, uh, that's what I would do in a live lecture hall, it's, but here it's, it's just not coming out very smooth for me. So I think um, I'm going to just try a little experiment. I'm going to just do all my typing while the recording is paused, and then come back and talk about it. It'll probably make the video go by a little faster. Uh, because it's a video, though, you guys have the power to pause type in your own, do your own experiments, uh, and I'm going to encourage you to do that. Programming is just one of those things you learn best by doing. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all of the text I just wrote right here, and I'm going to move it to a function so it's not in main anymore and gets it out of my way. I'm done with arrays. That'll leave me with an array function all nicely encapsulated, and I'm going to go on and do the same thing for pointers. I'm just going to develop pointers in main, and then we'll move them into a function 
as we move into the next topic. One sec, we'll be right back. All right, so I just moved that function, or all of that uh, code into a function. I called it array demo. I've got this at the bottom of the file so that uh, it's gonna be out of the way and not mess up, uh, so it looks good. Uh, I've cleaned up main, all that code's been moved, and I need a function prototype up here um, because I need to declare the variable so that C++ knows where to go find it uh, before I can uh, call, the, call that in the, in the main function. So good programming, programming uh, practice style is to do this. All right, I'm going to go ahead and write some stuff about a quick introduction to pointers here for you guys, and I'll be right back to explain what I've done. All right, so I've got my next example set up. I'm going to be talking about pointers here. And pointers are, they're just variables that hold the address of other variables. And then I can dereference the pointers to go get the values in those other variables where the address is. Um, to be honest, when I first learned about pointers, I really didn't understand it. This is, I found this to be one of the more difficult topics. And a lot of students uh, find the same thing. So what I'm planning to do is just sort of break this down into a lot of little steps that you guys can come back and review. Um, hopefully it'll make it easy to take notes. Um, that's the goal. Let me know how I do. So uh, first, let me start off with declaration. So if I'm declaring a variable to be a pointer, all I need to do is add the star. Um, the top line here in star x1, this is my preferred way to do this. I like the star to go right next to the variable. But I don't have to. I can put a space after the type and a space before the variable, so the second one is also valid. And I do know that a lot of people prefer the star to be next to the int or up next to the type. Um, the reason I prefer the first one is that be using the comma operator, I'm allowed to declare more than one variable on the same line. And if I want both of them to be pointers, the star needs to be, you know, they each need their own star. And it doesn't matter if I'm doing in space star x, we're going to have to do six, star x seven. Those are now both pointers. If I leave this out, what I've done here is I've created a pointer to um, an integer, called it x six, and I've created an integer x seven. So this star does not distribute over the comma operator. I need one each. And I just, I find this version right here to be confusing. Um, not just to me, but a lot of people do. It looks like the star goes with the int and that all of these variables will be pointers. And that's not true. The star goes with the x6 variable and x7 here will be uh, just a regular integer. All right, uh, before I like, when I pause the video again, I'll make a little comment right here about what's going on. Um, all right, so these are just creating pointers. Um, it's going to go, it'll put these on the stack if I'm doing it this way. And we'll talk more about the stack and the heap and memory management in a future lecture. Um, but for now, just know it's going to just um, put this somewhere in memory. And uh, this will be assigned the value, whatever memory uh, that it was used for before, it'll have a value in there. So basically garbage. So it's pointing to basically uh, a random address somewhere in memory. Um, I'm perfectly uh, able to write to that. Um, C++ is not going to stop me. So uh, frequently what we'll do is we will initialize the variable to null. And we've got three ways to do that here. Um, these all mean the same thing. I can assign it to value 0. Um, null is just another uh, macro-defined term for 0. And C++, the new version, uh, prefers a null pointer to indicate that, you know, a little more descriptive. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. It's going to assign the value 0. And the reason we might care to do this is if I want to test to see if a pointer has actually been assigned to a valid memory location, I can just use an if statement uh, and give it the pointer. And if it's been assigned to a valid memory location, it will not be 0. And it'll pass the test true, and I can do whatever I want dereference it, get the data. If it has not yet been assigned, if I initialize it to zero, and I always follow this, that will evaluate to false, and I will be able to deal with the situation where I haven't yet initialized the pointer. Um, just a quick note, the address zero, the memory address zero is not accessible. It's a reserved special location. So doing this is perfectly safe. Uh, I can't write to that. It will give me an error if I try to, a runtime error. 
All right, so some of the reasons that I may wish to use pointers. Um, first, the size of a pointer is always known. It's just enough data to hold the memory address. Depends on how many bits your machine is. So a 64-bit machine needs 64-bit memory address, uh, for example. Um, so I know the size. It means I can uh, initialize them on the stack. We'll be talking about the stack and the heap in a future lecture when we talk about memory management. Uh, so we're going to see pointers in three places where they're extremely valuable. The first one is arrays. And I'm going to talk about the array um, pointer connection in a little bit in, in this lecture. Um, we can also see that um, we'll have pointers that point to dynamically allocated data on the heap. So if I, if I need an array, I don't know how big it is, I can create that array on the heap, a special reserve place in memory, and just have a pointer to that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more in the future. Um, and it also is going to let me reference different kinds of data. If I don't know what kind of data I'm going to be processing um, uh, until runtime when the user decides you know, what they want to do, um, I can use a pointer to switch between like different sets of data. Uh, and it helps us enable things like polymorphism. All right, so let's talk a little bit about actually assigning a pointer to point to a, like a, a useful memory location. So here if I have, let's see, let's call it int x. Um, we'll give it the value 3. So I'm just declaring a, an integer. Um, and then if I have a pointer to an integer here, uh, I'm going to use this one, int x1. This is a pointer to an integer. I can say x1 is equal to, and I need the address of operator here. So the ampersand just means address of. And that's going to grab the, the address of the memory location where x is stored and assign it to x1. And then if I want to use that, here, let me actually pause the recording, type some stuff up so I make this a little smoother. All right, so I put some code together here um, using my pointer x1 that I've declared up here. I'm just going to declare an integer, uh, call it x, store the value 3 in it. So this is how I'm going to assign that um, the address of x to the pointer. So pointers are store addresses. The ampersand is the address of operator. So when I go ahead and do this, I'm going to print out x equals, and then the value of x, this should give me 3. When I print out the value of the pointer directly, remember this is going to store a memory address. So it's going to print the memory address where x is uh, stored. And then the star x1 here, this is going to dereference the pointer x1. And this is going to just follow that address and go get the data that's actually stored at that memory location. So here I'm printing out x1. And then I'm going to do a couple things. I've got the same print line, but I'm going to change x to 4. And then I'm going to use the dereferencing operator once again to change that same memory location so it's got a 5. All right. Um, one quick detail here. Uh, so C++ uses this star operator in several different ways. Um, if it follows a type, so if this is the name of a type, and then I have a star, this is creating a pointer. If there's no type, and there's the star here in front of a variable, that means I'm going to be dereferencing. That's, that means to take the address that's stored in the pointer, and go get the value stored in that address. And then we're also going to use the star for multiplication. Um, probably a couple of other things that I can't think of right now. Um, so let me go ahead and I do have one more example here. So a moment ago I mentioned that one of the things that makes pointers useful is that I can, like at runtime, switch which data set I'm looking at, maybe based on user input, and then use the same code with the same variable. So here I have an example. Suppose the user would rather have data set Y analyzed. And right now it's just an integer with the number 11. I can take that same pointer, give it the address of Y instead of X, and now all of the math I do will refer to the Y variable. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, run this real quick. Um, I already compiled it. I forgot the uh, exclamation mark. There we go. And now here's what we have. I have initially assigned the value of x to 3. This is going to be the memory address on the stack where x1 is stored. All right, uh, 7 FFE, blah, 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 60. All right, and then when I dereference x1, this means go to this memory address and look up what's stored there, and what we've stored at that memory location is the number 3. Okay, the next thing I did was I used uh, assignment 
to change the value of x. Change it to 4. x1 is still pointing to that same memory location. That's the same number. And now I see when I dereference, when I go to that memory location, it's now the number 4. And the third example, I was using this notation, star x1, and said that equals 5. So that's changing the same memory location. Dereferencing, uh, you can think about it like an alias, or just another name for this variable right here, x. Um, and it's changed both x and the dereference version. These are both the same number. All right, and then the last thing I did was I set it to y. So check this out. Uh, I'm printing out x still, it's still five. I printed out y, that's 11. This number here, the new address, is actually different. Uh, the only change is that last digit is a 4. It had been a 0. So these guys are actually really close to each other in memory. Integers are 4 bytes, and this is 4 bytes greater, so uh, directly next to each other. And now when I dereference x, I can see that I'm telling, I've told C++ to use the y memory location, and I'm working with an entirely different piece of data using the same variable name. And that can be adjusted at runtime um, based on user input. All right, I've gone ahead and added a little bit more code to this for my next example. So this is the new piece right here. I just want to mention that you know pointers are really highly connected to arrays. And in fact, I can dereference pointers using the same syntax as I would uh, accessing an array. Right now, this pointer, um, oh, I forgot the one there, x1, pointer x1 is pointed to the variable y, which stores 11. y is an integer, it's not an actual array. So that means there's, we can think of it like a, an array with only one element, and that's going to be at position 0. So I can also dereference using these bracket notation. Um, and when we start having pointers that point to arrays, well, we can use the bracket notation just like we can with the uh, array uh, indexing. All right, and the other example I've got right here, um, I'll run this in a second and demonstrate that it actually prints out um, 11. Um, but the other example I've got right here is uh, I'm creating... Um, a pointer that points to some dynamically allocated memory. In this case, I'm using the new operator that's going to go reserve some space on the heap for a string that's going to contain the letters of hello world. And then when I print this out, uh, check this out, this star follows the name of a type, so it's creating a pointer. This star does not follow the name of a type. Uh, there's no string there, no int, whatever, it's just on its own. Uh, is means that we will be dereferencing that uh, data right there. And anytime I use the new operator, I also need to use the delete operator. And we will delete that pointer. So uh, C++ uses a memory management library, and that keeps track of how much space has been reserved. Um, it returns a pointer to that location, and that's what I've got right here. Um, and then it also knows how much space has been reserved. And when I delete it, it keeps track of which pieces of memory have been allocated and which ones are free. So deleting it returns that memory to the available pool. And uh, it keeps track of how much is there. It knows exactly how much it's reserved for this hello world string. Um, and that can lead to some interesting challenges. Oh, let me let me just run this first and verify that it everything is working. So first, I'm going to uh, write this. Then we'll compile, looks good, then clear the screen, then run it. Okay, so we can see that x1 bracket 0, this still is accessing the variable y, it's got the number 11 in it, so that part worked. And we printed out the string, I needed to dereference the string, the ps variable right here is a pointer, so that contains a memory address. If I print the memory address, it's going to print it directly. So to actually follow that and go to the data, I need uh, the dereferencing operator. Hold on one second. I'm going to go get a picture. One second. All right, this is a pretty cool tool. This is actually Python Tutor um, designed to help people learn Python, but it does have a C++ mode that supports uh, quite a few features of C++, but there are limitations. But I think for this purpose, uh, it's going to be great. So this red arrow indicates the next line to execute, and I'm just going to step through these five lines of code. So the first thing it's going to do, it's reserved space already on the stack for x, y, and p. That's the first thing that happens um, when this is compiled. It reserves space and knows where things are. 
um, so I've assigned the value 3 to x, it's going to assign the value 5 to y. Now it's going to create this pointer and give it the address of x. So the way Py uh, Py or C++ in Python Tutor indicates this is it just draws an arrow to this box right here. That's the, the memory location where x is stored. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reassign p and give it the address of y. And now I can see it's now pointed to this y. Uh, if I dereference it, let me go ahead and edit this. I'll be right back. All right, I just added some code that actually makes some changes. Right now, p is pointing to the address of y. And when I dereference that, it's going to go and change what's in this box right here. So I'm going to click Next. It's going to upgrade y to 22. Uh, I can also use y to change the same data. Now y is 44. I hope this kind of picture helps you guys uh, make a little more sense of this. I'm going to go ahead and create some dynamically allocated space on the heap and show you what that looks like. All right, so I put together just one more example of allocating some memory on the heap. This is going to create a pointer to an integer. And in this case, it's going to be the very first element of an array of integers. So I'm creating an array of integers right here. It'll be on the heap created with the new operator. Um, this is another way to give an address to a pointer. Um, in this case, let me just um, scroll down a little bit so I can click Next. It's going to create pointer x, or px. That's going to point to the very first element of this array. And then I'm here, I'm just indexing. I can use star to dereference px. It points to the first element. So if I run this line, there we go, Next. It's going to change that to a 5. I can also use the bracket style indexing like with an array. They're very connected and that'll change this to a four. All right, when I'm done with an array, uh, the heap is dynamically allocated. It's up to the programmer, that's us, to manage that and not like continuously use more and more memory. So when I'm done with something, I need to delete it. So I'm gonna click next and, oh, I'm deleted, hold on one sec. All right, so I forgot that when I'm deleting a pointer to an array, I need the brackets here. If it's a pointer to just a single object or a primitive, I don't need the brackets. So that was a typo on my part. So when I do this, uh, it's going to return this memory back to the library that's managing the memory on the heap. And I love the way that the Python tutor has now indicated that this is no longer a good pointer. I still have the data. I could point it somewhere else. It's not pointed at anything in particular right now. Um, yeah, I think that looks good. All right, so before I go into some of the gotchas with pointers and things that make it a little tricky, I want to talk a little bit more about the connection to arrays. So here I'm declaring an array uh, of integers and just giving it some values, 0 through 5, so 6 values. And then I'm creating a pointer to an array, and just this is a pointer to an integer, actually. And it's going to point to the very first element in that array, just like I had in the, the C++ tutor, part of Python tutor package a moment ago. All right, and then I'm just going to print both of these out. So here I'm printing out each element of the array, and here I'm printing out each element using the pointer with that bracket notation. All right, let me just go ahead. I've already compiled this. Uh, run this. All right, you can actually see where I was testing this. So this is the new stuff right here. I'm printing out i rather than putting it here. So this is just element 0, and I've, I can see I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right, so let me just go ahead and continue. Um, now we can do, uh, basically, uh, uh, when I have an array of primitives, this is essentially creating a pointer to this memory. So an array is a pointer, but it's a constant pointer, so that means I can't change where it's pointed. Regular pointers, I can reassign. In fact, I had a pointer connected to x up here, and then I reassigned it to y right here. And I can do the same thing with arrays. Uh, so right now, let me just real quick demo this. I can take PRR, uh, my pointer to an array, and I can add one to it. And then it's gonna move to point to the second element of the array. So this should give me a one. Let me just copy this line again, paste this. I'm not gonna go all the way to six this time. I'm gonna replace that with five, well, four, because uh, I don't wanna run off the end of the array. And I've relocated P array to be started element one. Um, write this, compile this, and run it. So check this out. Um, here's the new stuff. 
right here. Uh, so I still have 0, 1, 2, 3 for the index. ARR is still 0, 1, 2, 3. I can't change this. But I've now upgraded P array, so it's now pointing at the first element instead of the element 0. Let me, actually, I'm going to pull this up in C++ Tutor and show you because the arrows will point different places. One sec. All right, I love this. Check this out, guys. Uh, this makes this so much easier to understand your first time through. Okay, so as I walk through this, my first line of code, I'm creating that array with um, six numbers in it, zero through five. Then I'm going to create a pointer and assign that to um, the array. So it's going to point to the very first element of the array when I do that. And then I have the power to do what's known as pointer arithmetic and move the location of the pointer in the array. So if I do p array equals p array plus one, it's just going to move over and point to the first element. Uh, I've got all kinds of options. I can do plus equals one, that's going to move it. If I then dereference this pointer and change the value, it's going to change the two to a six. It's not pointed to the very first element anymore. And now I've got two different ways I could access this. I could use array with the brackets two, or I could dereference p array, or I could use p array of zero. In fact, I've got an example of that in a second. Oh yeah, other ways to increment things. Uh, p array plus plus, that's going to move that over. p array of one. So now p array of zero would be this element right here in position three of the array. So p array one is going to be the next one over. It's going to change that four to a nine. There we go. Plus plus also works. It's going to move it over. Now points to the nine. All right, I hope this was useful. Uh, it took a few minutes for me to set this up. All right, so the next section, um, I'm just going to call gotchas. Things that are a little weird, little tricks um, that make pointers a little more complicated, and just some things to note. Uh, the first one um, is going to be the fact that this dereferencing operator, the star, has extremely low precedence. Um, this is just uh, how they set up C++. Anyway, I've got the very similar example. I've got an array with six numbers, 0 through 5. I'm declaring a pointer to an, uh, an integer array and letting it sit right there. And now this line, what I think this should do is dereference the array and then add 1 to the value in this box right here. So that should take 0 and turn it into 1. It looks like this should do the same thing, except the dereferencing is really low in precedence. So what's going to happen instead is it's going to take the p array and increment it, and that's going to actually move the arrow over to point to the next box. Then it dereferences. It gets the one and does nothing with it. It's just ignored. Um, following that, uh, yeah, hold on, let me do that. Demonstrate that that really low precedence makes this deceptive and doesn't do what I think it should. Um, because it's got really low precedence, if I want to increment this using this sort of plus plus uh, notation, the post increment, I need to put the um, parentheses around this to increase the, so this happens first. Uh, and then it will increase that one, change it to a two, just like that. All right, the second gotcha is known as a double delete error um, with pointers. So check this out. In this example, let me just walk through the code and then we'll talk about what's happening. I'm creating a pointer to an integer and I'm going to create a new integer. So this is going to, the new operator is going to reserve enough space for an integer on the heap. So I'm going to click next. So here I'm in main. I've got my two pointers that I declare. This one reserves space on the heap for an integer. When I dereference that pointer, it lets me actually write in the yellow box right here. So I'm going to put a five there. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do, I've declared another pointer here in y. I'm going to give y and y, it's a pointer, so it needs an address. x is the pointer. It already contains an address. It just happens to be the address of this memory location right here. When I click Next, I now have a pointer pointing to that. Now, it's important. When I declare variables on the heap, I'm in charge of managing that memory. So if I declare uh, reserve space on the heap, I need to free it when I'm done. And the command to delete, um, or to free up the memory and return it to the system so it can be reallocated, is just delete. If it's just a simple symbol, a single primitive like an int or a single object of a class, that's just delete as the command. If it's an array, then I do need those brackets like I screwed up a moment ago. But check this out. So I have two pointers that point to the very same place. Now when I delete it, um, it's gone. These are now pointers that don't point to anything valuable. Um, 
this is reserve uh, space that's no longer reserved it's likely still going to have the five in that location um, so these pointers are now known as stale they don't point to memory that are completely under their control if i in fact reserve more memory the library that manages the heap memory may choose to reallocate that same memory containing the five to another uh, pointer which may write over it um, the double delete error is going to be when I try and delete Y. So Y is a pointer. I know it points to something on the heap. If I try and do this, um, it's going to give me an error. Uh, actually, uh, potentially could give me an error. It could re uh, free up memory on the heap that's allocated to something else. It might do nothing. But here, this is going to give me a message saying it's an invalid free or delete or delete of the array. Um, and it's going to stop running. <laughs> Please fix your code. I love that. All right, uh, just be wary of that. Uh, you're in charge of memory management. You've got to delete it when you're done. Make sure you only delete it once. Okay, the third thing, it's not really a gotcha, but just something to note, is that we can also have pointers to pointers. Um, the number one place that I've seen this before is actually when we pass command line arguments to the function, or to our program. In that case, there's going to be two command line arguments. They go in the parameter space for main, uh, the first one is argument count, or argc is the most common abbreviation. I'm allowed to name it anything I want. Um, and that'll just be an integer of how many variables are, uh, how, many, how many strings have been input as command line parameters. The second one is a pointer to a pointer to characters. And these are the values of those um, command line parameters. So argv, v stands for values in this case. Looks like I got an extra character there. All right, and here, all I'm doing is I'm going to print out argc, um, should be an integer, and then I'm going to go all the way up from 0 to argc uh, and print out argv. So what I want you guys to remember is that I can treat pointers as though they are arrays. And so this is going to be indexing um, the first item in that array. So basically think about it as deleting a star, and that'll be like the first, um, in this case, pointer to another array. So can, it's like a two-dimensional array of characters. Or another way to think about this is uh, an array of strings. All right, the history goes way back to C where they didn't actually have strings. They just used arrays of characters. So that's kind of where this comes from. All right, let me go ahead and demo this. I'm gonna just quit out of this. Write and quit. We'll compile. Let's see here, G++, there we go. And now we'll run this. And now I see I get exactly one argument. The first argument is always the name of the function I wrote, or whatever I compiled it to. Um, so let me run this again. And now let's give it some other arguments. Um, SDF, query, just some random uh, garbage. All right, here we go. And these are all strings. So as it goes through, it's going to find out that I have four arguments. The first one is going to be the name of the program, always. And then I've got three legit real command line arguments, ASDF, QWERTY, JKL. If I want, I can put these in quotation marks and then have spaces in there. Run this again, and I see that it's now still got just four arguments, but it's now merged these together into one. All right, I feel like uh, this is probably about the right length for a lecture. I didn't get to everything I wanted. It's taking me all afternoon to put these examples together. It really is very time consuming, but I don't feel I can wrap up a lecture about pointers without talking about references, uh, also known as aliases. All right, so, and the reason for that is because it uses the ampersand operator again, but in a different way. And this is a major source of confusion for people. So when I was talking about pointers, I was using the ampersand as the address of operator. And I was saying a pointer is equal to, and then I was giving it the address of some variable. In this case, this works uh, just like pointer declaration compared to pointer dereferencing. Uh, if I'm creating an alias, it will always follow some type. In this case, it's a primitive like int, but it could be any type. Um, and so when I use ampersand, this is just going to create another name for this same variable. All right, so they're very similar to pointers. It's just a way to give a second variable uh, a name, uh, another name to a variable. That's exactly what I want to say. So in this case, I'm taking the variable x, I'm assigning some data to it, 
then I'm going to create another name for that same memory location. Uh, inside of C++, these are usually implemented as pointers. Uh, not necessarily, the compiler may optimize that um, and do something different. But it gives me uh, just another way to change uh, the value of that memory location. Uh, it can never be null. I have to initialize it to something. So anytime I create a reference, it must be part of an assignment operator or an initial initialization. I can't just declare a reference. I can never change it. So I can't go and say um, y is equal to z or some other variable. It can only point to x or can only reference x. Uh, and there's also no need to dereference. It's, it's going to be treated as just another variable uh, not as a pointer as far as like when I write code. Inside it's going to use pointer most likely to implement this. Um, so if I want to change that variable, uh, all I need to do is type y. And actually, hold on one second. I think it might be easiest to see this um, with this uh, C++ tutor tool because it's got the picture of what's going on in memory over here. So as I go through, first I'm going to declare uh, variable x and store the value 4 in it. Then we'll create an alias or a reference and give that x. And inside what's going on is it's creating a pointer to that location. Now x lets me change this uh, and I'll change that to 3. And then I don't need to dereference it. Um, it's a reference, not a real pointer, even though that's what's going on inside. So this bar right here is the inside the machine on the right, code on the left. Okay, so I don't need the star, and in fact, putting a star here would be an error, but it lets me still change this same value. Both x and y are um, the same memory location, essentially. It's one way to think about that. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap things up right now. It's uh, actually after 6.30, which is my goal to have all of this edited and rendered. I'm um, looking at 6.43. Ooh. Um... Anyway, I'm going to go ahead. Next time we'll be talking about parameter passing. Um, so we'll be passing arrays to functions. We'll be passing uh, references to functions. We'll be getting references back. So we'll talk about all the different parameter passing and return kinds of things with functions, particularly arrays. We'll be talking about multidimensional arrays. And we'll be looking at specifically um, character arrays also. All right, but anyway, I'm going to put that together on Friday. Hopefully it'll be ready to go this weekend, and then we'll be all caught up. I'm very excited about getting to that point. I find it very stressful to feel like I'm behind. Anyway, um, I hope it hasn't been too much of an inconvenience for you guys. I apologize, and I hope you all have a great day.